Richfield, Washington is currently the fastest growing city in the state of Washington. And with the growth in the city comes a change in needs. I myself am a 24 year native to the city of Richfield. I played in Richfield Little League myself and I've seen the growth and the changes as they've happened. And so I'm excited to get in this conversation. Thank you to Paul, Michael, and Nick for joining me on the podcast today to talk through Richfield Little League, the Richfield and Spud City Mashers, the program that they've started, and the future of baseball in Richfield, Washington, from playing in the Little Leagues all the way up through high school and playing with Richfield Raptors. And if I haven't met you yet, my name is Connor Webb. I am a Richfield native, and I'm a full-time mortgage broker during the day. When I'm not helping my clients figure out their financing needs, I'm on here making sports videos, talking about my favorite teams in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm looking forward to helping coach the 13U team with the Mashers this upcoming season. I'll have my contact information in the description of this video if you'd like to reach out and get in touch, whether you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, or if you'd like to just talk baseball. And also a big shout out to Deb's Coffee Bar in Battleground, Washington. This is where the podcast was recorded. If you're into coffee, go check them out. They have three locations in Battleground, Orchards, and Camas, Washington. And with that, let's get into the podcast. Man. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Thank you for kind of putting that, the feeler out there, the idea. I'm excited for the conversation. Absolutely. So I think if we just start by going around, kind of introducing who you are, a little bit of your background and how you're involved w with Richfold, you know, baseball, and then we can get into the topic. Sure. So start over here. Yeah. Paul Stenback um, got involved in baseball when my kid showed up at Richfield Little League and was his first year in T-ball. And my wife, who's an educator, said, that dude needs help. <laughs> and I was like, the hell do I know about baseball? <laughs> so I played soccer all the way through my end of high school uh, into Olympic development or whatever. I was, a, you know, an athlete, but not like an over-the-world, over-the-moon athlete. And, uh, she, uh, you know, I thought, what do I know about that? She's like, well, you're a good parent. I could teach you things you need to know about kids, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, why don't you do it? And we're on air, but she, you know, it's kind of a dude's world and she wasn't interested in that. So I asked him if he wanted to help me. He's like, please. <laughs> and I said, okay. And then I started helping out with youngsters baseball. Um, probably two or three years after that, um, I got asked to join the board um, and said yes to that. Initially just to help them sell banners. I was like, that's a job I can do. I sell software for a living, so I put that into play and uh, sold a lot of banners for the league and then got asked to join and take over their peewee t-ball division uh, and then ended up getting to vice presidency by, I think, a weekend of too many beers, and then she quit. <laughs> and I walked into a board meeting, and they said, we've elected you president. Will you accept or not? And uh, yeah, I never played baseball a day in my life. Apart from that, I coached uh, my kids' teams from – the ages of you know, they were four and five all the way up to right about what did I get away thirteen ish, and then handed them off and uh, handed a program off and in the prox in the byproduct of that we created Spud City Mashers. So you've been president for how long? I was president for four years. Okay, yep. cool. Long time ago. Feels like now. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I think we'll get back into the Mashers piece later, but that's a yeah. story for sure. Cool. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Michael Lalane, and I'm the current president of the Spud City Mashers. Um, I got involved in baseball in Ridgefield in uh, 2020, uh, the COVID year. So I was coaching a peewee team and I was on my way to practice and I got an email that it's all shut down. So mm. we made it through like two practices and that was the end of that baseball season, 2020. And uh, since then I've coached peewee and minors, uh, Ridgefield Little League All-Stars. Um, and this year I'll coach a peewee team, a majors little league team, and uh, the 11 U's mashers team. So really excited about this year. I'm, I'm Nick Allen. I'm the head baseball coach at Ridgefield High School, and this is uh, year 12 for me at Ridgefield. Um, was in Arizona for 10 years prior to that at a couple of different high schools as a head coach and um, started coaching in 1999 at Seahome High School up in Bellingham. And uh, so yeah, it's just kind of been a, been a journey. I can't believe it's been 12 years that I've been in Ridgefield already, but, uh, and then I, I help with the Raptors in the summertime and assistant coach with them since 2019. Uh, and I've done all kinds of stuff with USA baseball and a couple of different avenues with them. So, um, yeah, love being in Ridgefield and, and love that we have some passionate people about the game of baseball. Yeah. 
I think it's an awesome community in Richfield. And uh, Michael and I were talking off air. I think it'd be good to kind of start with like a little bit of my story because it ties directly into what you guys are doing with Richfield Little League and the Mashers. I grew up in Richfield uh, since like 1999, 2000. And I went through Richfield Little League myself and my parents ended up getting a boundary exception for me to go play at Skyview in Vancouver, uh, myself and my younger brother, because my older brother was going through Ooh, the Richfield School District at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and they thought that we would have more opportunity in sports going and playing 4A instead of 2A. Mm -hmm. And also with, with the school part of it too. So Little League did his at El Metro and then into Skyview, you know, baseball. And it's just now, you know, went off, did college, came back and got into mortgages out, out of college. And now we're getting to the point to where, you know, we're thinking of starting a family and uh, some of the people that, you know, our neighbors from growing up, um, Jason Beatty, mm -hmm. he's, you know, kind of running some of the stuff and helping out. And so he reached out and I've been starting to hear a little insight on what you guys are doing. And I think it's awesome. And I, I don't want families and kids to leave Ridgefield. It's like, I'm trying to show people now with my mortgage and real estate YouTube channel, mm -hmm. why Ridgefield is the place to be for mm -hmm. now in the next 15, 20 years with how much growth is coming. Yeah. So can you walk me through the, the start of mashers? Uh, let's start back with like a general overview of Ridgefield Little League and the history of that and the progression up until this point, like let's go through the last decade with the, the growth that's been happening and how everything's been changing. Yeah, I mean. How long has it been since you've been out? I've been out. Six years? That's about right. Yeah, so so seven years. And so you're that, that puts you when you stepped in as president about a, a decade. Pretty much, yeah. And I mean, you had a couple of years prior to that that you could probably speak to, but, um, and we were, you know, we had kid in the league at that time, but. Richfield Little League, it's this story has more to do, and tell me if you think differently, with the bond that brought the Rourke. Yeah. Right? That's when I think our world kind of got flipped upside down. Um, Little League in Richfield was, well, moving to Richfield 18 years ago now was like coming to Pleasantville, right? From, from a kid that lived in Vancouver his whole life. Uh, everybody drove the speed limit here. <laughs> It was amazing. Nick's team played baseball on Pioneer in town, and and it's a parking lot now. I mean, I could romance about that for a while. But People would pull in and see yeah. the, the home of U-Haul. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sure, but more in, from a baseball vantage point, right? Like, it all happened downtown, and there, that was a, that's a very different vibe than exists today. And uh, we, you know, Abrams was a really special place. It's kind of going that's back where I played in, growing it up. It was like going back in time, right? You go down well, there. On and, the, and the fact that, that it was just right down the hill. You could run through the woods <laughs> on the cross-country trails, on right? the cross-country course to yeah. get down to to um, to the Little League. I mean, we'd go down there on opening days. We'd be up taking BP and, oh, okay, we got to be down Little League opening ceremonies. We cut BP and the whole team, we'd just run down Trying the hill. Down the hill. Yeah, and it, and it was really it was really cool that there was kind of an epicenter downtown like that. Super interconnected. and But, the, you know, growth hits everything. And I think you're probably second year in when we hit, we hit and started to hit records for number of kids that signed up to play. Um, and then you don't have enough space to do practices. You don't have enough space. And pretty soon you're – you know, you're calling the city and asking if you can have the ports land down there. And then just trying to figure out how and what patches of grass you could work off of to get kids practice time. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as a little league season started in at least our second year, I mean, you could not practice on the fields after the, after the get things got going, you had, and it mirrors, you know, what you see in, a, in an elementary school, you got 12 kindergarten, you know, classes in a, in a union Ridge school or give or take, right. That bottom end of kids is coming. Um, and ironically town passed a bond and I'll talk about this just briefly, but like we passed a bond and a lot of people believe that the Rourke was built with bond money and it was not. So what the city said is if you guys pass this bond, we'll pony up and put the seed money in to build a park. And we all hit the streets and pounded doors and got a bond to pass. And that built the extensions to the two elementary schools it turned the middle school into a uh, rack mm -hmm. and it added the, the big middle school up the hill and Rourke. And then, I mean, everything changed, right? You've got the high school tearing its field down, moving up the hill. You've got the Raptors thinking about coming to town um, and baseball also in parallel to that. And then I'd like to hand it off, but like, that's the little league vantage point. I think getting back to that, 
we started to see departures in like the 10, 11, 12 age brackets and <laughs> tournament baseball or whatever you want to call it, club baseball started to spawn and it started to pull kids out. And instead of initially, I think there was a desire to fight that. And instead of that, we started to just look at how do you embrace it? Can a kid still play little league and, and play on their, on their club squad? So first year, you know, we had like one kid per majors team that was playing double duty and that's all right. And we worked on arm, arm care with the, you know, their coach and, and our current coach and, and sort of tried to integrate those two things. And I think eventually that's what spawned first Ridgefield baseball Academy, which Nick can talk about. And then that idea manifested into the mashers. Yeah. And I, when, when I got here year one, the little league was a little bit of a mess there, you know, little leagues tend to have financial issues from time to time. And <laughs> Ridgefield literally kind of had that going on a little bit. Um, it, it was, it didn't seem real organized. Uh, and then, and then I remember when Paul stepped in and, and things started to get cleaned up and then, and then he left and Jason Nyberger stepped in and, and again, it kind of continued that path a little bit. Um, but yeah, it was, there was a real void when I first got here, there was a real void from the end of that majors spot when they're 12, yep. uh, until they, they get up to the high school. And when I got to Ridgefield, our biggest rival, um, was, uh, our soccer team. I mean, I'm not kidding. Year one, take a talent. <laughs> I'm I'm cleaning dog poop off the field because the soccer team dumped dog poop all over our dugout and on our mounds in the base plugs. Yeah. Wow. Wait, and like a purposeful. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sabotage. Because because the baseball players had done something to the goals. This is before before I got there. Something had happened the spring before. So the next spring they retaliated in my first year here, <laughs> and so that was kind of mission number one. Was like. And our soccer team was really good. And our baseball team, we, you know, we were, I mean, our first year we went seven and 12, you know, we, we were young, didn't have a ton of talent. Uh, we were a new two a school that year before they had been one a, they'd been back and forth every two years, one mm -hmm. a to two a, and the two years before they had been one a. And so, I, and I looked at the soccer team and thought, man, there's a lot of athletes over there that should be playing baseball. <laughs> Started talking to kids around campus and like, Hey, you know, why aren't you playing baseball anymore? Why did you choose to go to soccer? And and the response that I got was, you know, when I got done with Little League, there was nowhere for me to play unless I wanted to go play um, club baseball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of kids just don't want to foot that bill, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, that bill was a lot less back then. Yep. Um, 12 years there ago. There was a lot but, less. But talking about it, too. Yeah. But it was yeah. still it was still a, a big bill at the time for people. And so. So that was mission number one. So, you know, there was some people in the Little League that were creating that had created a Ridgefield Baseball Club. Um, and we kind of built off of that and built Ridgefield Baseball Academy. So I just kind of had my own little thing where I was doing some winter camps and stuff and working with uh, Little League kids that um, like little guys. Right. Because I can't work with uh, fifth graders and below or six, six, seventh and eighth graders. I can't work with them when we're in school, just the same as my high school kids. So um, we tried to create that, and then it also was a fund for our own summer ball season with our high school kids playing Babe Ruth or whatever we were doing. Um, and so, yeah, so that that really created – there was a need there. And I, I think I'll kind of stop yeah. there and then and – Yeah, and the, 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 need is, the need is still there. I think that gap, you're correct, you know, after 12 years old, that's the, the gap that's kind of problematic. Go back – I guess about 25 years now, back in 2000 and 2001, I played for the Vancouver Storm. Uh, I don't know if you remember who the Vancouver Storm or you might know who Ryder Construction. I remember so, Ryder Construction. Ryder. They, yeah, right. They were involved uh, here too. Youngest kid graduated yep. from, from us in 19. Yeah. So Sold them sponsorships. Um, so my, <laughs> my honest claim to fame uh, is I played on the 2001 Vancouver Storm State Championship team that dethroned Ryder Construction. So Ryder had won like 13 straight gotcha. state titles, okay? And that was that was eight. <laughs> we should do another podcast. I'll pull as many Vancouver Storm <laughs> kids together as I can. But that was 18U baseball. So if you were a really good 16-year-old, you might be able to play on the Vancouver Storm. Sure. Uh, but you're probably going to ride the pine. You know, I... I played as a 16 year old on the storm, uh, didn't play much, uh, but it was a great summer. We took second in state that year, 
to Ryder. Um, luckily, we came back the next year and, and handled our business. But that was 18U baseball. So the gap after you were 12, there used to be Mid-County Babe Ruth. So they had like 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old Mid-County Babe Ruth. And if you were one of the elite, you know, Babe Ruth kids, uh, you would make the Mid-County All-Star team. And then you would go get your butts whipped by Hazel Del Metro, right? Which sounds like you played with that group in, uh, in Babe Ruth. Yeah, I did Hazel Del Metro, which is like, I think, like seventh grade, eighth grade yep. in that range. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of also the time frame, the time of year that you play. Is his at El Metro, is that summer? It stuff? was so it was right that spring? when the high school season would end. So there yeah. was no conflict okay. at all because it was just right when the yeah, high school yeah. season ended. Some, some you would go and play on one other baseball team. Um, but it wasn't a cash grab. It wasn't uh, you know, a two thousand no, dollar program. You know, kit it was an affordable program and it, it was an opportunity to get a little bit of exposure, you know, to get, get in front of, uh, you know, some of the high school coaches, the first, uh, mid County team I played on when I was 14, um, the head coach for Prairie high school, Don Freeman, and the head coach at battleground was Ron Rockesey. And they, they were both part of the coaching staff there. I think Freeman wanted to be part of it because he had a few really good players coming through the Prairie program that were on our team. And then Ron Rockasy from Battleground, uh, his son was on our team, so he just coached the team. But it was just so much different back then because it was uh, 18U existed, but I don't even remember there even being a, a 16U. It was just mid county well, baby. That was yeah. That was the old system. Like that was, and that was pretty much statewide because you know the years you're talking about. I was up in I was up in Bellingham. And I was coaching the post seven Legion team, and and that's what Legion is yeah, that's what the, that's what most most of the like Rider Construction was a Legion team. Yep. I'm pretty sure, as was Hazel Metro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then before you got to Legion, you played Babe Ruth. So like most people yeah. had a had a Babe Ruth had a Babe Ruth program, and um, that that fed that Legion. And and usually, like I, I remember Legion when I played in the mid nineties was there was there was uh, what the triple a and double a and then the and then they added single a and the single a was basically 15 u the double a was 16 u the triple a was 18 18 u became 19 u and so back in the day like in the you get into 010203 um there was a path there there was a path where you played babe ruth that's what everybody did they played babe ruth and then they played um then they went and played their double a legion and they probably did. You probably did that for two years, maybe three, and then you'd play your AAA Legion. You know, your after your senior year of high school, or maybe if you were really good, your your junior year of high school, which is right. situation sounds like you were in. Um, and and there was a path. And I remember the year that I moved, the summer that I moved to um, to to Tucson, I was coaching the the AA Legion post seven team that was strictly C home high school players. And, um, I went to a meeting, a, the league meeting, and there was just all this talk about, you know, Legion's going to expand its numbers to compete with club ball and stuff. And it was like, that was the beginning. That was 2000, that was 2003, summer of 2003. And, and you started, especially on the West, West side of the mountains, you started to see that, that structure break down, um, and I was gone for 10 years in Arizona, but when I came back, it was completely different. Like nothing was the same. Babe Ruth wasn't the same. Legion wasn't the same. Everything was, everything was, was club ball. Yeah. Um, and, and back and, to your, you know, trickle down to little league question, right? That's when Cal Ripken started to eat <clears throat> the notion of, in some respect, majors, but definitely intermediate and juniors baseball just, just mm, disappeared. Right. Oh yeah. Which is fine. I, I think. But it is what it is, right? And so then you're like, what do you yeah. do about that? I'm right. Just, yeah. It's how do you, how do you, it's a new, it's not, you know, yeah, none of this is like the breakdown isn't a negative thing. It, mm -mm. It's the, it's the way of the world and you, you've got to learn to adapt. So, yeah. so what's the, the current day of uh, the biggest struggles? Why are people still leaving Ridgefield right now? Is it leaving Ridgefield or leaving Ridgefield Little League? Ridgefield Little League. So as of, the, la so as of last year, the masters program didn't exist, you know, wasn't alive. So essentially kids, the elite kids would make Ridgefield little league all-stars. 
and then their choice for the following year. So if you were a nine-year-old and you made the 10U All-Star group, you were in an awkward position. You know, you could come back and play minors at the Little League again um, or and maybe play All-Stars again, or you've already been there, done that. If you have an opportunity to play on a club team, then and that's what happened. A lot of kids left to Woodland or to Salmon Creek to play on club teams. But uh, we're, and, and are those travel teams? They are. Club yeah. Teams. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they yeah. play short roughly distance, local 40, team, yeah. but 45 yeah. games. They go to, you know, okay. Bend, Kennewick, you know. Okay. Um, but most of the games are in the Vancouver, Portland area. Okay. You don't, ha- you don't have to. I mean, you're going to, I think, travel a bit. And, and certainly the age of, of, travel ball is now descending right and that yeah. that that carrot gets dangled and mm-hmm. you know no offense to the parents that, that live in the region but they chase the carrot um and you know it isn't a matter of quality at the little league level i think it's a matter of what you what you do or don't want for your kid and at what age you want it for yeah. them i mean the recreational sports are amazing they should exist they should make it continually accessible um and you know opinions are going to vary on when it, when a kid should get or, or be more everybody's going to have their own answer for that um when we when we well when Ridgefield Baseball Academy was created and then subsequently Ridgefield's you know Ma- Ma- Spud City Masters was was really a way of saying okay there's kids that aren't going to make that program can't afford that program don't want that program play too many other sports to attach themselves to that program how do we accommodate for that group um and so self-servingly we, we were like let's let's build something yeah like that's them, a that's way really to keep objective. playing baseball with an underlying mission of some sort that like if you could establish that and kids or families would take that bullet and, and go okay i could do that i could i could fully you know i could still play some little league and then i could get some extra baseball i can still be attached to, to the town that i love play with my friends all of that then then maybe that's enough and eventually separating it from the little league and letting it run on its own with the longer term goal of keeping a core group of kids together when they arrive at the high school's mm-hmm. field and and hopefully you know keep them together through the summer and give the high school coaching staff perhaps a reason or an opportunity to stay with those kids and, and give them more time together mm-hmm. yeah. uh, that vision's tough uh you, you know everybody wants to go pay for the best next thing and um, so, you know, what do you do about that? And so mm-hmm. this is, this is, you know, I think the modern day problem is the same. I think it just extends to a deeper, younger age group. Yeah. I think the, the objective is like, people are going to leave. You're not going to stop that. I, I've never, I mean, there's kids in the middle school that are coming up to high school and they still go to, they still go to Skyview, you know, they go to Evergreen Mountain View, whatever, and other, other sports they do. Um, and, and I, I, you're never going to stop stop that from happening. If people want to do that, you know, go do that. I'm going to coach the kids that come through our door at Richfield high school and I'm going to, I'm going to coach them hard. Um, and you know, whatever that talent level is, we will develop them, you know, um, as long as they come in committed. Uh, so the, the objective is to, to get more kids playing baseball. That's really yeah. what it's about. Mm-hmm. Um, and knowing that, that families are going to do what's best for them. They're going to make the choices that are best for them and as they should. Right. Absolutely. And, and should not, you know, no, there's no mission to try to stop them. There's no mission on our part to try to say that club ball is some sort of evil entity. It, it isn't, yeah. it, it, it has its purpose. And what, what we've tried to do is it, over the years that Paul and I have been working to try to create this is to try to create something that fits the needs of a separate set of people. Like the people that want club ball, you have, or travel ball, you have what you need. And so if you want it, go get it. Good luck to you. Um, you know, hopefully we can stay connected to them in some way. Um, and they, they still come to Ridgefield high school, but we, you know, we want to, the objective should be to promote the game of baseball to as many people as we can. Right. And, um, you know, for example, the last school I was at, in in tucson was it was a dying high school program dying little league situation um it might be one of the worst high school baseball programs in the country now to 12 years since i've left it's a sad state of affairs it's in the inner city in tucson and um that if i would have stayed there that would have been the same objective we got to get more kids playing baseball and and i i think that i think it's an easy goal to to accomplish and and again just open the door to uh, uh for to the game access to the game to more kids yeah. that's really what it's about yeah.
I think part of that is also making sure that baseball doesn't just become a rich kid sport, you know, yeah. um, you know, some of these tenure programs cost like $5,000. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I like to think I'm a baseball purist, you know, if let's say if Johnny tries out for a tenure team and, and he's good enough to make the team, he should make the team. But if his family can't afford $5,000 and Bobby over here has parents that make good money and he gets to make, the, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. And so the, you know, the masher something we're doing is we're going to make sure it's affordable, you know, that, that it's not just a cash grab that the coaches are volunteers. Uh, quick story, you know, I was at a 10 U tournament uh, a few months ago and it was June 15th. I remember cause it was my, my sister's wedding and I, I officiated her wedding that afternoon. So I was pretty nervous. I was really nervous. I didn't sleep the night before. And I told my wife, I go, do not tell your little sister that I didn't sleep. Right. Cause I was like, don't stress Michaela out. Right. So I didn't sleep and we had an 8 AM game uh, at a baseball tournament and uh, I'm driving to the tournament. I'm exhausted and my son's going to be the starting pitcher and we're playing the number one ranked team in the state of Oregon. They're 17 and three. They've only lost games to a team from Colorado. They're throttling everybody. So I'm like, oh, this, this is, is going to be a rough day. So we go to the game. Um, my son was lights out. He threw a two hitter. He two hit the number one ranked team in the state of Oregon. And I was like, I was riding this wave of adrenaline, which got me through the wedding, luckily. And that went great. The next day, between tournament games, we end up at five guys and the coaches from that team were there and they get to talking to my son and I, and they're kind of recruiting him a little bit. Hey, you should look into, <laughs> look into, you should look into our program. It's a program out of Tualatin, Oregon. Uh, Nothing you want better than to drive to Tualatin. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't even want to drive from Super Ridgefield to Woodland, right? I just want to play baseball in Ridgefield. So anyways, we're at five guys and they start to pitch the program to us, you know, and, uh, and it was $5,000, you know, and, you know, again, I just, I can't stomach baseball becoming a rich kid sport because like he said, I mean, now we're eating away at the numbers, you know, inner city kids aren't going to be signing up to play little league and little league is that first step. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a problem with tournament ball. Tournament ball is good for baseball. We need competition. I think part of the problem, though, is like these 10U teams and 11U teams, now they have an A and a B team. So you might call it black and green or you might, you know, varsity, junior varsity, whatever. I don't think these travel ball teams need to have a B team. No. You know what I mean? That Now you're really starting to eat away at the Little League kids, you know. And that's where I think well, the mash is going to be. Right. Well, that's yeah. That's where that every, every kid's a check. Yeah. You got to feed the machine. And, yeah. Can you imagine how many checks if it's yeah. $5,000? Right. <laughs> And you have a few hundred kids in your program. Yeah. And yeah. math is hard to ignore. Yeah. That's, and that's a, that's a reality of it too. And, and I, I think that that is, if there's a knock that I have on, on the travel world is that, and especially in Clark County, to be honest, it's, it's, it's a little watered down. You know, there's a lot of them. I was talking mm -hmm. to a lady at school today. She came into my classroom and saw that, <laughs> Oh, you're the baseball coach because there's, all of our baseball what stuff all do, over in my do, room. Coach? Yeah. What do I do? And she, and she said something to me and she's telling me about her kid that plays and he plays for some club team. And I'm, and I'm like, she's talking to me like I should know this club organization. And I'm like, I, that's a new one. I asked her, I said, that's a new one. Isn't it? And she's like, yeah, I think they've been around a couple of years. Dad's kid is on the highest age group team. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Seen it. And yeah. I, there's just so much of that. It's just there's there's a lot of options, and I don't really know that we have the talent pool in Clark County to to feed the number of club teams that are out there right now. So there's a bunch of club teams in, in Vancouver, and yeah. do they all play each other, or do they go travel know. other places to a play? A little bit of both. It depends it, on yeah. the team. It and runs the gambit. Yeah, I yeah I think some of them travel close by, you know, Bend and stuff like that. Like Paul was saying. Um, and then I, you know, I think each of the orgs have kind of a higher end team that will travel a little bit further. Um, so, and, and, you know, so there is that, um, there's also a pretty thriving 
and um, I think, you know, well put together group of just Cal Ripken, Babe Ruth, independent teams right. that kind of all funnel underneath of one very hardworking volunteer. Yeah. And so you can, you can play whatever version of uh, extra baseball or non little league baseball you want to, whether right. you're doing that from now, I think you could say that pretty easily from about the 11 age on, you can choose your, your destiny. Yeah. You can make relationships in town. There's lots of ways and easy, easy, easy approaches to doing that. And our first foray into doing this was simply that, like, let's give this group of kids who's like sixth graders mm -hmm. and nobody's calling their houses and asking them to, you know, come and sit at a recruitment meeting. And, and they're honestly, a lot of the little league parents at the time, just not super aware of what the world had to, had in store. And so it was, right. it was an easier way to satiate that and keep them local. And not that you're trying to keep them from going anywhere. I mean, yeah. Creating the path for them. So yeah. they know where to go yeah. rather than them being out there floating in the wind on them by themselves. And, They've got so many options. What do I do? There, we, we run into a lot of people like that in town. Well, and to your point about the AB squad, right? Like, I think one of the things that's missing in youth sports is honesty. <laughs> like, that's not a good idea for you. You're just going to play at the bottom of the ladder or get kicked out. What about this? opportunity for yeah. you to play this game instead of watch this game or mm -hmm. and you can make that about how much they're paying for it but you know one of the arts of youth sports is being honest with the kid and saying look you're it's not going well for you or it really is going well for you i think one of the conversations we were having at the end of my time at little league was why are we trying to convince that kid to stay their lights out they <laughs> They need more. They need better competition, different competition, exposure to different people's voice and language around the game that they're playing. They they deserve that as as much as you need to say to a, a kid, you know, if I could get an opportunity with your parents, I'd tell you, like, you do what you want to. I'm not here to sell you on anything. I'm trying to help you maybe from an educator and coach's perspective understand what's good for your kid. And we do live in a place, Ridgefield, where, you know, there's a lot of misalignment on that, like – Got to have the fancy things and do the fancy stuff and build fancy buildings. And we, we miss out a lot on, on the, you know, the understanding of what's best for that little human um, and giving more options as a route for that. Mm -hmm. So with Spud City Mashers, how many teams are there going to be this next year? And when yeah. it has there already been an official Mashers year? Or is this the first one coming up? Yeah. So okay. So back a little bit, and then I'll let you had go to the there team. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we we had um, we tried this Ridgefield Baseball Academy thing, and it, it was it was honestly it was too much for me to try to run on my own to try to uh, to run it as the high school and then trickle it down. And so when Paul left the little league, he and I started having conversations about filling this gap in between little league and high school. And so we, that's when we created the mashers mm -hmm. and we targeted it at a, a group of kids that was in, that played with his son. And, um, and then again, the idea was get more of them out of this class, which mission accomplished. We got them to high school. Uh, and so we kind of followed it. We followed it up. We followed that group up as they came into the high school and what they played a 15 U season. Yeah. They played from 13. They played seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Together seven, eight, nine as, together. as, as the a, mashers, as a mash with group. our idea being that we were going to take that down um, as we went and we were really close to it and I'm going to blame it on COVID. I think that's a fair, fair recipient. I mean, because steam was being gained. Yeah. And by the time they were eighth grade summer kids, we added one of Nick's staff to the, to the squad. Right. So now you're going to walk on the field with an understanding of their system, their language, their approach. Yeah, our high, uh, we had it, yeah. And so that was a yeah. huge win, right? And not selfishly for my kid, but the group of kids that we were servicing who hadn't had the desire, opportunity, ability, or otherwise to go out and do the thing, right? So – it, it worked and then COVID happened and everybody got turned in that upside down. A little and then, bit. yeah, then, then that, yeah, just that one year of no baseball, like you were saying, you get pulled off the field after two practices and you didn't come back for how long? 14 months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, it, and so that pathway got erased a little bit and then it, we try, we went to restart and there was kind of another thing that had been developed <laughs> and okay, let that other thing go. Well, then, so then we were we we kind of said, all right, you guys got more momentum going on yours than we do, 
and they re what they did is restart a Richfield baseball club and then that fizzled and it we kind of went a year here where we've been like yep what what's going to happen yeah. and and then all of a sudden in July this conversation struck back up and yeah and I'll so tie it back in a bow and then I think yeah. you can you can put put an answer to that question so my kid got you know got injured and also a little disenchanted with baseball, made good decisions, decided not to play a senior year and got asked to coach a, a little league team. Um, and I hadn't been playing with the little league. I didn't pay much attention to it. I went and supported my kid and this group of kids and they went undefeated and had this crazy season. And then that group of kids predominantly formed the majors all-star squad for the summer or for the, you know, the, the late spring games. And uh, when, when I was watching that group of kids, I remembered our seventh graders and their undefeated season and their master's season that followed it, the inaugural one and how much fun they had and thought, man, you should do the same thing. And so Jason Beatty, the coach of that squad, I said, you should, you should suit these kids up in masters and do all the things we didn't do. Like we didn't need to wear little league uniforms. You can double, you could call a little league team wherever you want. And you could put those 50, 70 intermediate kids on a team and let them play their regular season, little, a little league squad uh, roster and then fold out into the summer and play a couple of tournaments, play some double headers, get to that, you know, magic 25, 30 game count and get it all rolling again. And then he brought it to a different group of folks. We came, we sat down and long story short, we, we decided that this group of new guys has the steam, the depth, the kids, you got to have younger kids to be engaged and get something off the ground. And so uh, we, we asked if they would put, breathe new life into it. And that's, that's where we are. Yeah. No, we had uh, we had sixty two kids try out, and uh, pretty exciting. The biggest group was uh, the the ten year old group, so we will have a 10, 11, 12, and thirteen. Uh, the thirteens are the team that you were talking yep. about there. Uh, Nick and his coaching staff did an awesome job. I mean, you were at, you were at the tryout as well. Uh, the thing I loved about having your squad there was they scored the kids, and we got some honest data you know they yep. clock the kids running put a pocket radar you know on the pitchers um you know they scored the kids fielding uh, ground balls fly balls throwing the ball across the diamond um and it was all pretty accurate data you know i reviewed it and it shook out the way it probably should have <laughs> shook out honestly. i always love that though right? you know like you, you put a bunch of numbers down on paper and they don't they don't usually lie yeah right what's yeah. nice too is you know for an organization where you're trying to deal with youth sports and your children are involved you had outsiders mm -hmm. help gather data about what they saw yep and it makes that claim of like you said oh is, is, is his kid on the top team probably right mm -hmm. usually that kind of correlates right. with how much time and attention they're getting yep um but yeah it gives you guys a defensible opportunity to say look and we've been doing that a long time have somebody else come rate the kids, whether it was Little yeah. League or, or or this. It really helps avoid that daddy slant that, that can be tossed out. It won't stop it from happening. But Yeah. So, we, yeah, we'll have four teams. We're trying to keep kids in their grade, you know, so we'll have fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, you know, so we're trying to keep that. Uh, pretty excited about the 11-year-old group, my, my son's fifth grade group. Uh, pretty loaded. There were a few kids that – didn't defect. There were a few kids that were good enough to do so. And that just didn't, you know, that they play other sports, they play basketball, football, and they didn't want to go to Salmon Creek or Woodland. And, uh, and they're going to be on our team this year. So those kids were good enough to play on the other travel ball teams. Uh, and we're pretty loaded on that 11 year old group. I'm, I'm really excited to see what, what they can do on the field, but also just the whole program. I mean, there's kids in the community that were, that just, didn't have anywhere to go. Ridgefield Little League's great, you know, go ahead and go play minors, go play majors. Uh, and then if you want to opt in for all-stars, you can. Uh, the cool thing with the master's program is all the kids can also opt in for all-stars. So our version of going to state would be, you know, all the kids can opt in for all-stars. And if you win the district, which I get the feeling we're going to trend in that direction. If our Little League is getting stronger while the other local Little Leagues are, you know, trending in a opposite direction, then uh, I, th I think in the near future, Ridgefield Little League will be sending teams to state. Uh, and that's pretty exciting for Ridgefield. Yeah. And while we're on camera and talking about Little League and running tournament teams in parallel and blending them, right, there's, there's an appropriate and or legal way to do that. And then there are other approaches to it, right, where 
Um, you know, you don't travel inside your little league and you let them play each other and you disguise what you've got for talent. And then you put them in a tournament with a team that's basically been together since the beginning. The idea of little league is to, is to take the four teams worth of, 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 uh, majors kids you get and build even teams that can play one another and hang with one another. Mm -hmm. And the difference is usually coaching camaraderie blossoming of a kid that you didn't see, but it's not about stacking the deck and, and predetermining what your all-stars team would be. Um, and there's a long line of, you know, folks that have spun off a secondary team and run that team in parallel because it was essentially the all-stars squad. You know, we'll see what their experiment, whether the data plays out or trues up, but you are in, in essence, Above the above board, having an extra baseball for these kids, they did have to come try out. They did have to compete and earn a spot. Um, and if that group of kids happens to be the predominant group of, of all stars, then they will go and compete at a better level because they spend more time together. But you didn't do it because you were like intentionally generating and pre cooking, pre baking that cake. Um, so I think it's just I just think it's important to to talk about you know the idea behind trying to compete in little league without cooking the books and trying to generate a predetermined outcome. So there's four age groups, four yep. teams, yep. and they did, it was like a cut thing to where. Yeah. You okay. Yep. And that, that's the toughest part. You know, uh, you know, a cup, I made a couple tough calls. Uh, that was probably the worst part for me. I, I hate that, you know, he's used to it. This is his job every year. Um, I probably should have bought him a case of beer and made him make those calls, right? No, but uh, <laughs> not for that. No. Like, you know, cutting an 11 year old is not fun, you know? Right. Um, I, I really didn't enjoy that part, but the reality is, you know, we, when you go to a tryout, you understand what a tryout is. You know, it's, you know, when you go fishing, they don't call it catching, you know what I mean? You know, you know what yeah. you're doing. And unfortunately, you know, there were kids that didn't make it, but I think that shines a light on how awesome the turnout really was. I mean, to have 62 yeah. kids come out, we got the word out there. I mean, Ridgefield is just blown up. I, mm -hmm. I was really surprised. Uh, I went and watched the, uh, 10 U all-star group. It was this last year. And, uh, so that was not my team. I had coached the previous year and I, I saw a couple kids. I was like, okay, we got some dudes right there. And they uh, they all tried out, and we got some of those kids on, on in the program. So yeah, well, there's the ancillary benefit of honesty as well, right? Like Little League calls it evaluations. It's not a tryout. They don't they don't right. have they've never had the experience or exposure to what that's like, and the opportunity to get it or to not get it isn't a guarantee. Um, and that's a cool and essentially a tryout's free, right? So a free opportunity for a bunch of Little League kids to get an exposed to get exposed yeah. to what that made it or didn't make it. And to get in front of this guy. And, and that's a, you know, that's part of that honesty package, like helping someone understand what they are or not capable of. And yeah. I mean, good. cutting, cutting kids is, um, against my religion. It feels like, you know, it's like, I'm an educator. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here to help yeah. all kids and from all walks of life. And, but yet, you know, I, I tell my coaches at, at our tryout in the spring, I two things, you know, you're evaluating the kid. We have a rubric. We, we can score them on if we need to, but the, it comes down to CHP. Can he play? Um, can he do the things on the baseball field that we need to? Does he deserve the opportunity to, um, to, to develop? And, and then the second thing is that numbers dictate every decision that you make. And, every time. Um, and, and in the high school program, it, it determines everything. It's like, who, how many are we cutting? What do our numbers say? What, how many, uh, you know, who's on which team? Our numbers are going to dictate that largely. You know, we can't carry a, 10 man C team roster, you know, we need to have 12. So what does that look like? And, you know, what do we do with, is, is this kid going to be a varsity kid or is he a JV kid? Our numbers dictate that. And so I think in this case, yeah, it's a little harsh to, to think that we're, that we're cutting, um, we're cutting kids that are 11 years old, 10 and 11 years old. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, the numbers dictate that and man, the demand was there for this thing. And that's awesome in town, but that does create a, a situation where you have to make some tough decisions because you're trying to create something that, um, is, is special for these kids one and, and two, you're trying to up the ante for them in the game of baseball and get them some more access to it. And you can't provide that to everybody. Nope. That's just the reality of, of the world. And I think that the message that, you know, when we had our meeting last week to talk about the rosters, I think the messaging from the group is spot on that <clears throat> this is this year. Okay. Like you need to, you're going to work and you're going to get better. You're going to go play your other sports 
and you're going to come out and have your little league season and you're going to get better. And next year we're going to have another tryout and you have an opportunity to make that team next year. And so I, I think that philosophically from, um, from what I heard at the meeting last week from the group was, was really, um, in line with where they need to be with the fact that they had to make some tough decisions on some kids, but they're making those decisions, I think in the right way. Um, and, and that's, that's good. That's, that's a, that's a positive thing out of kind of a negative situation, I think. Well, and it affirms that we gave this thing to the right group of dudes. Yeah. Right. Well, like absolutely. you guys are, yeah. you guys are going to go do great things. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. No, I'll name drop uh, Derek Fink is my assistant coach and he's another really good baseball guy. That's part of this program. And his son will be on our 11 U team as well. And one thing Derek and I have talked about when we're building a team is, you know, I don't need eight shortstops, you know, the best you, you get these kids out there and you put you know, usually the best player on the team at this age is the shortstop. You know, he's also the best pitcher, you know, and, you know, maybe the coach's son. But bottom line, you don't need eight shortstops. You know, I need a few outfielders. I need a few middle infielders and ideally a couple athletes that, you know, we can move around utility guys and you better have a couple catchers, you know. And so, you know, when you don't make the cut on a baseball team, it, it's not a, always because you weren't good enough. You know, you, you might just, just right not have fit in to the system. You know, you, you might have had no, that's you know, the numbers. You're a first baseman, man. You, you know, some kids are left handed, oh, right. which is great in some ways. Left handed but, shortstop. Right. It's not going to happen. See him anymore. on the little league field every right. once in a while, right? right. <laughs> Appreciate you, bud. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> man. Yeah, it's. I think. Uh, I think it's going to be a really good year, though. We we're starting to think about tournaments. We signed the eleven U the eleven U up for a tournament in Bend, so that's the the plan as of now, at least. You know, to have set up a couple nice tournaments. We'll probably when the little league season ends before All Stars really fires up, we'll probably take advantage of that couple week window to try to get a couple tournaments in because we're not trying to hurt the little league. You know, we're going to do the the true little league season. And uh, we'll have to take advantage of that Memorial Day weekend and maybe a tournament before Little League starts. But uh, all the Masters coaches are coaching in the Little League. Cool. Yeah, so I saw the email today uh, for the 13U team that there's going to be uh, practices throughout the winter. And then so what's the actual yeah schedule for the Masters this next year? And then how can people get in contact with you guys if they want to learn more information? Yeah, I mean, we're planning to do some winter workouts. Um, I'm trying to pull together some really good college and possibly some pro players for uh, some free clinics for the mashers and uh, try to even put on a pitching clinic for the Little League if possible. Um, so as of now, we're still working on the schedule, you know, because – who would have known? It's a lot of work to fire this thing up. Well, I mean, just you, get the board up. It's you guys been a went lot. from you went from a, an impromptu introduction to two tryouts and four teams in a month. Yeah, right. A lot's the, happened. Like, yeah, so, I mean, so it's I was, been really quick. We handed yeah, I was them a in, random. I was that's in, basically it. They lit a dynamite off. Yeah, okay. I can't remember. I was in Springfield or Yakima with the Raptors mm -hmm. when you said, "Hey, by the way, right. this is happening." Right. And, so that was mid July ish so, when the original conversation started, and yeah. then, and then bang, here we are. And you got you're building the plane as it's in flight. To be to be frank, right. I mean they, they deserve all the credit and space in the world to get that going, and they will. But there's logistics to be worked out, and I think each of those age brackets kind of has a different mission in terms of what they've got an appetite or ability for, and so they're working through those kinks as well. Yeah, for sure. I think our eleven U team will actually compete in some tournaments and i think the 13 year olds will too i know the 12 year olds are working through some things but i mean all all, all three of these groups the, the 11 12 13 from from you know what we saw is is it the nucleus and they're hopeful that they can get as registrations pile in and and little league kids show up like if you sign up for the 13 year you're you're on that team you're on a master's team it's only doing one one squad so they've kind of got that already in motion but yeah, it'll be it'll be good for you guys, and and you know you get to decide what level of baseball you play beyond all stars, which is the real I think the real opportunity is that you know back half of June and into into a little bit of July, giving you an opportunity to play more baseball and get those kids thinking about that rhythm, right? Because as you go to high school and then you're playing summer, and it's, it's all about sort of trying to get them to the high school field 
um, with the idea that for most of them, that is it. I, I do have one more question. With the Raptors coming to town, mm -hmm. has that kind of sparked the young kids' interest in playing baseball? Mm -hmm. or yeah, I, I, I absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it um, I, it's, there's been an uptick. Um, uh, I mean, I think so, there was going to be an uptick naturally just because of the number of people that are moving in. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll go out and I'll run down the line and coach the first base box. And I'll look down into the corner you know, to just to the right of the, the visitor bullpen and the half cage, you know, we wheel the half cage across the walkway so that it's not in the way. And the kids are down there playing home run derby. And, um, you know, I, I go and I'm around town. My, my uh, assistant coach lives in town and I, I show up, we have coaches being at his house and there's kids playing baseball on the street mm -hmm. and, um, and they're little dudes, right? They're like four or five, six years old, but they're they're Mikey Kane and Doyle Kane <laughs> yeah. and Will Chambers Jacob and Sharp. Jacob Sharp <laughs> and they're like being the they're being Raptors really yep. yeah yeah awesome. it's so cool That's like awesome. Doyle came back this summer and and that family came onto the field I was like Doyle this is the kid man because I <laughs> I texted him when this happened I was like Doyle you're not gonna believe this man and I I texted him like you're not gonna believe this this kid's Doyle Kane man and he's hitting off a of Mikey yes. Kane's pitching and Dude. like That's awesome. Yeah, so there's definitely, and you know, we run those camps in the summer with the Raptors, and and man, 150 kids plus. We've had 200 kids out there for a camp before, um, but we've been kind of the last couple of years we've settled in right around 120, 150 kids, and and we're getting them from all over the county, and and I think that that's a testament to what Gus and 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 Wade and Tony have done, and Jason Crone. Um, the leadership group with the Raptors is that they've really, it's not just Ridgefield's team, it's Clark County's team. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think that they've done a good job of executing that vision. Um, but there's, there's no doubt there's, there's a, there's a, there's an immediate impact on, on Ridgefield baseball. And, and when I got here, when I came up here to interview from Tucson, my wife and I went down and we drove downtown and we parked right outside the right field foul pole at the old field on, uh, on pioneer and and i sat there and leaned on the fence and i looked around and i was like this is this field's it's garbage like <laughs> this this field is not good um but man there's something about it and then i started doing some research and and you know oz had been here for so long and um and and i just really got the sense that this was a baseball town and I, I, I arrived here because of Don Freeman and Don Freeman said that he said, this is, it's a baseball town. They love sports. Um, be patient with it and, 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 and it'll grow and it'll become what you, what it, it could become something really big. And, and I think we're on the precipice of that right now. Um, and, and it's been a really fun journey and, and the Raptors are a part of it. The little league's part of it. And, and just the, the sense of community that you get from being a part of all those organizations, it's really, it's pretty, it's pretty dang rewarding for, for me. Just, I'm just trying to do my job as good as I, as well as I can. And, um, and yet you get to see something that is, is really a positive thing for a great community. And, you know, I live in the community. My kids go to the high, I have a senior, I have a seventh grader. They're walking around. She's walking around with these masher guys and, and, and you see kids walk around town. They're wearing masher's gear. They're wearing, raptors gear they're wearing spud gear i mean it's it's cool man yeah. it is so cool to to just uh to be a part of it it's community you know i i took my eight-year-old well he's 10 now but a couple of years ago we were at a raptors game and it's an intimate baseball experience it's like awesome experience you know i hadn't taken him to a raptors game yet and so i was like dude i'm gonna get the best seats in the house right which are like <laughs> 20 dollars instead of 12 right <laughs> and uh so we're sitting front row and the Raptors on deck hitter comes up and the people sitting right next to me, I guess, knew him. I think he was living with them. Probably. And uh, they were handing him peanuts through the fence. Oh, that's Will Chambers. <laughs> and he's, it was Will Chambers. Right? Will Chambers had that group. Yeah, they feed him peanuts all season long. Dude. He didn't He didn't live with them. He just became buddies with yeah, them in the on-deck circle. Peanuts, right? The mayor of Ridgefield, Will Chambers. Dude, seriously, though. So Self-proclaimed. You know, so my son is watching the on-deck hitter eat peanuts, you know, and then go up and, you know, rip a shot in the gap. <laughs> and absolutely, it helps grow that love for the game because that's what this is about. I mean, the love for the game is the most important aspect. I mean, who hasn't seen the movie The Sandlot, right? That was my childhood. 
we lived in an apartment complex. We played baseball in a tennis court. Uh, and it, you know, it was, it was just like the sandlot, you know, you'd ride your bike to a local little baseball field and, <laughs> you know, you just played the game cause you love to play the game and it was fun. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think that little by little that love has been corroded away and, uh, some kids like the game, but I'm noticing that kids tend to love soccer or football or basketball. And, uh, I think with this Masters program and with Raptors baseball, I think in Ridgefield, we're going to help uh, grow that love for baseball here. And I, I think we're going to end up with some really good Little League All-Star teams, some really good Masters teams. And I think we're going to end up with some really good high school teams. And that's the hope, man. It's all community. We want to play baseball right here at home. And I think that's that's a really important aspect of this whole thing is is what what drives it. And, and these are the things, this is, these are the principles of it. And that's why in the summer, when this conversation restarted like that, this was like, we have, this is the vision. This is the principles that we, and these guys got on board with the, that plan. And, uh, I, I think it's really important because the, the, the biggest thing when it comes to, um, youth sports is adults oftentimes just oh. get in the way for real. and they screw it up for kids. And so let's create a situation where we don't do that. Yep. And, I, and I think that that like meeting these guys and working with them a little bit this last month and a half has been, you know, you learn pretty quickly. They've got they've got a good vision for it. And and so when you get to talking about the community aspect of it and stuff, that's what that's why we're here. We want to give kids in our, in our kids in our community the opportunity to play the game. Yeah, awesome. we got to do better for the kids. Baseball is a beautiful game. But we have to do better for kids. I think you heard me at the town hall. I say adults ruin the game. It's, adults ruin sports. Kids don't ruin sports. Kids are just trying to have fun. That's it. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's what this is about. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. It's hard to remember, but it's good to have reasons to remind yourself. Yeah. How can people get in touch with the mashers? So you can email us through Spud City Mashers Gmail. Yep. Right? Is it Spud City Mashers at Gmail? You got it. Dot com. Uh, we are getting our website set up live and, uh, we're still working on that, but that'll be up pretty quick in the next week or two. We did get social our, media. our social medias up. So we got the Facebook and the Instagram up. We're starting to grow those things. And so, uh, we're going to make it really easy for everybody to get a hold of us. And, uh, and we're just community. So really, if you just talk to people in the community, You'll yeah, maybe. Well, in the right and direction. blasting out on Peachtree too through the school district, right? Didn't I we? Did, did, did we do that? that? I'm not sure if it happened. Oh, okay, yet, okay. That's that's an avenue that we need to use. I mean, you guys got the you got to the numbers, so now the next thing is just to put rosters together and decide what they do. And I think you know if 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 uh, schedules happen, I think that'd be a cool thing to put out there so people could come. How cool, right? You know, watch the kids play games and stuff. But it'd be rad to see some yeah. community people in the community just go show up and watch a Masters mm -hmm. game. Hopefully, you and your family can come out and watch our 11 new group and you could see me coach and critique, you know, my oh, game. Well, that's and the notebook that's will be out. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> Nick's sitting there. Okay. Yeah. We're going to need wrong, to work on wrong, that. Wrong. You thought your kid was a short story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going <laughs> to talk now. about that later. We should try pitching with his other arm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't um, look right. But I'd say, you know, I, I think the Instagram page is probably the most, you know, effective way to get a hold of them. I don't have to think about an email and there's okay. definitely people behind that, but you know, no, uh, definitely a plane in flight kind of a vibe so trying to figure out everybody's roles and yeah. getting all squared away but yeah so find the mashers on instagram send them a dm yeah yes such yep sweet that'll work well awesome yeah i really appreciate you appreciate you guys coming on it's gonna be fun to watch this thing grow and to be able to help you a part of it and let's make Richfield the baseball town again yeah absolutely i love it i love it thank you thank you thanks for having us appreciate sweet. you